Yamcha Racing. Though commonplace today, there was a time in gaming history when 3D graphics were rarely seen, if ever. Due to cost and hardware limitations, games relied entirely on 2D graphics. Early attempts at 3D used isometric sprites and vector lines to make games have a three-dimensional look on budget-friendly 2D hardware. The first game to be made up of polygons was Atari's iRobot in 1984. While groundbreaking for the time, its higher production cost and price resulted in lower sales. Thus, Atari halted any further development into 3D. It wouldn't become viable for the arcade industry until the decade was almost over. In 1988, Namco debuted the System 21 with the racing game Winning Run. It was their first 3D arcade system, and one that would pave the way for more to come. The following year, Atari gave it another shot with Hard Driving, and it proved to be a success. These games not only turned a profit, but also caught the attention of an industry rival. Throughout the 80s, Sega had become one of the biggest names in the arcade business, with every title they released pushing the limits of 2D graphics. Zaxxon's isometric view was impressive in an era where spaceship shooters only went vertical or horizontal but it was their 16-bit superscalers that really stole the show. The systems could scale and rotate sprite layers at blazing fast speeds. Seeing how well Namco and Atari's transition into 3D had gone, Sega decided it was time for them to enter the world of polygons. The project was handed to their research and development department number 8. However, in the middle of development, Sega went through a major restructuring. The team remained, but were now under a new name. The Amusement Machine Research and Development Department Number 2, or more commonly known as AM2. Leading development was legendary developer Yu Suzuki, who was responsible for Sega's biggest hits of the 80s, including Hang On, Space Harrier, Outrun, and Afterburner. Sega's CG board took three years to develop in collaboration with Fujitsu. It was revealed to the public on March 27, 1992 and would later be renamed to the Model 1. The board operated on a 32-bit NEC V60 CPU and could display 180,000 polygons per second. Of course, the reveal was accompanied by a racing game then called BV. It began development alongside the Model 1, and contrary to popular belief, it was not intended to be just a tech demo. According to Suzuki, it was always intended to be the first game for the Model 1, though when they started, it could only run on a PC, as the arcade board was not yet ready. Development started with only 10 people, but that ballooned to 25 by the end. Suzuki oversaw the project, but its lead designer was Toshihiro Nagoshi. That name will sound familiar to Sega fans, as he would later create the Yakuza series and become Sega's chief creative officer until his departure in 2021. Suzuki originally wanted it to be an off-road racer, inspired by the Dakar Rally. However, Sega wanted it based on Formula One as a response to Namco's winning run. The machine showcased at the event included a full-size replica of an F1 car placed in front of a 36-inch widescreen monitor created by Victor. BV would make several appearances at trade shows until July 10th at Shibuya Gold, where it was under a new name. Virtua Racing would appear in Japanese arcades in August of 1992. It raced its way to North America that October, and finally Europe a month later. It came in three cabinet configurations. Single-player upright models had an optional seat and were exclusively made for outside Japan. The twin cabinet let two players go head-to-head, -head, 
and the Deluxe only supported one player, but included a built-in widescreen dubbed Wide Vision. Despite their differences, all three versions could be linked to one another for up to eight players. Separate monitors could also be purchased for onlookers to view races. There were over three different tracks to choose from. Each were of varying difficulties. Big Forest was a perfect beginner course with wider curves and a shorter length. Bay Bridge was aimed at intermediate players, while expert players could have their skills challenged in the Acropolis. Your objective was simple, five laps with you and 15 other racers. Of course, for an extra challenge, arcade operators could switch over to Grand Prix mode that upped the number of laps to 20. Players weren't just racing against opponents, but also time, as you had 60 seconds to finish the race. However, hitting each checkpoint added 10 seconds to your timer. To really show off the power of the Model 1, every cabinet included a special VR button that when pressed, changed your view in real time. All four POVs let you zoom in from the driver's view behind the wheel, or zoom out to see the vast road ahead. Cabinets that were linked up but not used in races instead displayed a live broadcast of the race in progress with commentary by Mr. Vert McPolygon. Despite being quite advanced for its time, the game was far from realistic, but it was never supposed to be. Despite being based on Formula One, Suzuki said that the car handled more like a Bugatti sports car. Hitting objects and other racers would stop your car while you swerved in place. Completing a race in first unlocked an ending, showing you receiving a trophy, and lay your claim to glory for the fastest time. <music> Virtua Racing stayed at the top spot of Replay Magazine's 10 Best Deluxe Arcade Games well into 1993. It also laid the groundwork for Sega to continue their jump into 3D with Model 1 games such as Virtua Fighter, Star Wars Arcade, and Wing War. Another version of the game was introduced in 1993 as Virtua Formula. Essentially, it was the same game, but now players would race in a full-size replica of an F1 car placed in front of a 70-inch widescreen. Hydraulics under the cab synced with gameplay to make players feel every curve and crash. There were also cameras facing players to show onlookers who was behind the wheel. The attraction was aimed at amusement parks and larger arcade venues, and Sega had them prominently set up in their own arcade chains around the world. Formula only came in 8 and 4 player attractions priced at around 96 to 48 million yen. The high cost made some arcades charge 500 yen per play, but that didn't stop arcade goers hungry for speed. Despite Virtua Racing being quite advanced for its time, Sega still tried to bring it home. As Virtua Racing was popping up in arcades, the home console industry was in the middle of what could only be described as a 3D arms race. Seeing it as the future of gaming, each console maker was trying to be the first to successfully bring 3D into homes. The Atari Jaguar and 3DO were the first dedicated 3D home consoles. However, despite advertising how powerful they were, neither ever truly gained enough traction to make an impact. Sega and Nintendo each had new consoles in development that would render polygons with ease, but they still had years to go until their inevitable launches. Only their current systems, the Genesis and Super Nintendo, were viable contenders. However, both platforms had been developed as 2D machines. 3D was possible, but severely limited. Atari's Hard Drive-In and its sequel Race Drive-In had been ported to the Genesis and Super Nintendo, but were almost unplayable. To get proper 3D required extra horsepower. The first out of the gate was Nintendo with the Argonaut-developed Mario 1 chip, better known as a Super FX, debuting in spring of 1993 with Star Fox. However, Sega's approach would be revealed only a few months later as the Sega Virtua processor. Unlike Nintendo's offering of 10 MHz, the SVP ran at 23 MHz and could generate over 9,000 polygons per second. 
plans originally called for it to be a modular cart that only included the SVP, with games sold as separate smaller cartridges, similar to Comerica's Aladdin Deck Enhancer for the NES. However, this and plans for a steering wheel controller were scrapped due to falling interest in the Genesis and production costs. In the end, only one game would be produced with the SVP, and it was none other than Virtua Racing. The project was headed up by AM2 member Koichi Nagata, with supervision from Suzuki. Virtua Racing came roaring into Japanese homes in March of 1994, and later in the year for North America and Europe. Due to its oddly shaped cartridge and the SVP's high manufacturing cost, it sold for an MSRP of just 100 US dollars. The move to the Genesis saw a drop in polygon counts and resolution, but the arcade experience remained the same. You now had a free mode that let you practice on each course without any cars. A second player could jump in for head-to-head -head -to action, and you could replay every race. There was also an unlockable mirror mode that let you race through courses in the opposite direction. The Genesis port really showed what the SVP was capable of running at a steady 15 frames per second, quite a jump from the Super FX's 10 frames. However, there were still some setbacks, such as the system's limited color palette and heavy use of dithering for shadows. However, at the time, this was unnoticeable, as the blurriness of composite video and CRT televisions perfectly hid the dithering and made it all blend together. It's also one of the few Genesis games that can't be played with the 32X or Genesis Model 3. Still, Virtua Racing was well received by critics, noting how well it ran but feeling it was a bit too short. In a strange twist, it wouldn't be the only time Virtua Racing came to the Genesis. As the SVP version was heading to stores, Sega announced the 32X. The Genesis add-on could render more polygons than the SVP and display 32,000 colors. The 32X first launched in North America on November 21st, 1994. At launch, only three games were available. Star Wars Arcade, Doom, and Virtual Racing Deluxe. The 32X version offered more than just the base arcade classic, but now included three new vehicles, Formula, Stock, and Prototype, as well as two new tracks, the Freeway Highland and the Desert Roadway Sand Park. Deluxe ran at 20 frames per second and relied less on dithering than its Genesis counterpart. It's also considered the best version on the system, and for a while it was thought to be the best console port, However, the hardware it was on wouldn't last long. By the time Virtua Racing came to the 32X, Sega was ready to move on. The Model 1 was no longer cutting edge, having been replaced with the Model 2 in 1994. It had been co-developed with GE Aerospace and Lockheed Martin, and could render more advanced and fully texture mapped polygonal models, and debuted with Virtua Racing's spiritual successor, Daytona USA. Even Virtua Racing was no longer Sega's most popular arcade game, having been dethroned by the massively popular Virtua Fighter. Just before the 32X made its way to Japan, Sega had already released the Saturn. The 32-bit Genesis successor was vastly more powerful and included a CD drive that allowed games to be far bigger. The popularity of Virtua Fighter made it a priority when it came to a Saturn port. Sega had also focused on bringing Model 2 titles such as Virtua Fighter 2, Daytona USA, and Virtua Cop to the new platform. 
though virtual racing wouldn't be completely forgotten, having been picked up by publisher Time Warner Interactive and released at the end of 1995. The Saturn port had a selection of over six car types, Formula, Go-Karts, Coupe, F-160, Prototype, and the hidden F-200. Only the three arcade tracks returned, with seven new venues to test out. Amazon Falls, Surfer Speedway Oval, Alpine, Surfer Speedway Road, Diablo Canyon, Metropolis, and Pacific Coast. There was also a new Grand Prix mode that took you through all 10 tracks. However, instead of choosing your vehicle, you had to start with a go-kart and graduate to the next car. Each vehicle was unlocked using points gained from your placement at the end of each race. The jump to the Saturn received mixed views, but wasn't enough of a success to save Time Warner. The Saturn version would also be the last home release for a long time. Though it had done well in Japan early on, the Saturn was never a major success. By 1997, it quickly fell to third place behind the PlayStation and Nintendo 64. Realizing there was no salvaging the Saturn, Sega decided to replace the lagging platform with its planned successor. The Dreamcast launched in Japan at the end of 1998. The Naomi-based system was a powerhouse that brought near-perfect arcade ports home, and titles like Sonic Adventure and Soul Calibur were a massive leap from what the Saturn offered. Unfortunately, their success wouldn't last. As it was getting ready for a launch stateside, Sony unveiled the PlayStation 2. Hype for the PlayStation's successor was massive, as Konami and Square threw their weight behind it. Despite their best efforts, in the end the Dreamcast was no match for the PlayStation 2. Coupled with mounting financial losses from their past failures, Sega announced in early 2001 that they would discontinue the Dreamcast and exit the console market. They brought many of their upcoming titles to their former competitors' platforms. It also freed them up to delve deep into their past. Starting in 2003, Sega introduced a series of budget titles called Sega Ages 2500, named after their price of just 2500 yen. Each volume contained remakes and ports of Sega's older games from the arcades and consoles. The collection was developed by 3D Ages, a joint venture between Sega and D3 Publisher. It would continue until 2008 with over 33 volumes, and the eighth was Virtua Racing, flat out. Most of the collection never left Japan, but Virtua Racing and eight others would find their way in North America and Europe as a Sega Classics collection in 2005 and 6. New to this version was another Grand Prix mode where players had to complete five races in a row. Finishing would earn you possession points that unlocked more cars. In addition to the classic three tracks, three new ones were added, including the easy-going island, the treacherous roads of mountain, and the streets of Beltway. The PlayStation 2 not only allowed it to run at a higher resolution, but at a solid 60 frames per second, with shadow mapping and different times of day and weather. As Sega was continuing to release more volumes in the Ages 2500 series, they received a pitch for virtual racing on the Game Boy Advance. The prototype was developed by Dream On Studio and pitched some time in 2005. Unfortunately, it would be rejected as Sega was shifting focus from the Game Boy Advance to the recently launched Nintendo DS, and the company going through a major restructuring. The prototype was virtually unknown until 2012, when project manager Ben Yoris uploaded the only known video of it to his YouTube page, One Vision 34. Virtual Racing would be brought to mobile phones in 2008, but sadly it would be another 11 years until it returned to consoles. In 2018, Sega reintroduced the Ages line as a series of remasters for the Nintendo Switch. 
they retained the original graphics while adding quality of life features. The following year, Virtua Racing would be added to the series. The remaster was handled by M2, who had a good history of bringing classic Sega titles to the Wii, PlayStation 3, and 3DS. Originally, M2 thought of bringing the 32X version to the 3DS as part of the 3D Classic series. Unfortunately, it lost a fan poll and the idea was scrapped. When Sega Ages was rebooted, M2 was determined to port the original arcade version. Of course, this was no easy task, as the original source code had been long lost. They had begun the arduous task of remaking it from scratch using code from Virtua Fighter in Daytona USA. However, in the middle of development, they had a major breakthrough. Age's lead and legendary developer Reiko Kodama had reached out to former colleagues about any code they may still have. As it turned out, one of the former programmers still had code from Virtua Formula. Since it was based on code from Virtua Racing, they were able to redevelop the game to its former glory. The Switch version is a near-perfect recreation of the arcade classic. It retained the original aspect ratio and polygon count while improving draw distances and running at 60 frames per second in native 1080p. It also added a new feature no other version ever had, online multiplayer. For the first time, eight players from around the globe could race each other in a world of flat shaded polygons. Though there were still a few issues such as item collisions remaining in 30 frames per second and colors being a bit on the light side. A glitch caused your car to take a pinkish hue, but that can be fixed by switching to Grand Prix mode. M2 was praised for doing an amazing job at reviving an arcade classic, and it can be still found today on the eShop. However, it has yet to receive a physical release or be ported to another platform. Virtua Racing may not be Sega's most famous or successful game, but it's one of their most important. It ushered in a new era for the company and became the inspiration for all of their future racing games. But Virtua Racing is more than just important to Sega's history, but of gaming as a whole. It was the first game released with native widescreen support and one of the earliest to depict humans in 3D. It may not be much by today's standards, but in 1992, Virtua Racing was just a glimpse into the future of gaming. Alright folks, and that was the Virtua Racing Retrospective, but it was also the first mini retrospective. Now, for those who don't know, um, at the end of Doom Part 2, I talked about future video releases, and that essentially there was going to be three retrospectives. One main retrospective that would be about the length of Metal Slug, and then two mini retrospectives covering games that maybe only lasted one or two entries and that would be it you know stuff that i can get out quickly in between the main retrospectives and of course you watch the first mini retrospective which is also kind of an experiment it was meant to see how i could pull it off and how it would work out and it worked out beautifully i i got this thing done in like less than two months i'm really happy with the way everything kind of came together and uh because of that i've decided to add a third mini retrospective to the year so the good thing is from now till the main retrospective which is planned for sometime in september that means i have from now till then to just get that whole thing done so and then the other ones they're the the other mini retrospectives they're not going to take a lot of time at least i hope they don't take a lot of time but i have a lot of faith that this whole thing's going to work out so though unfortunately because of doom part 2 there was another big retrospective that i had actually planned for this year but i had to push that back till next year uh, but like i said i think everything's working out i think everything's coming together I, I still have a lot of faith in 2024. I think it's going to be a good year. So 
But anyway, with all of that out of the way, I just want to once again thank you all for watching. Uh, you're always a lovely audience. You're always supportive. And that, I can't, I can't thank you guys enough. So I'll see you until the next retrospective. And remember to keep gaming.